One of the things that I thought about for a long time after I saw the film was seeing Joycelyn later in the film having changed her mind uh, about something she said earlier. And I just thought how infrequently in documentaries you see that because often people are invited into a film to express a preconceived point of view. But to me, I also like it because I like this idea of a journey. So I'm wondering if each of you could talk a little bit about something about the film that you had an idea about that might have changed over the course of making the film. For instance, if we can start with Margaret, if you had an idea about what the film you were gonna make was gonna be that turned out to be different than the film you ended up with. Um, I would say two things about that. Um, one thing is that uh, I, the thing I love most about documentaries is you never know what you're gonna get. So, um, so I love that about what we do. And the second thing I would say is I thought the Mayer family would talk to me because I made a film called Order of Myths um, 15 years before that, before this, um, 11 years before we started this. <laughs> and, um, and, and they were in that movie. So um, Helen, I made a movie about segregated Mardi Gras called Order of Myths and Helen Mayer was the queen that year. So um, you know, I made another film about my hometown and the Clotilde before, so I thought, the Mayer family wasn't talking to anyone, but I thought they would talk to me because Helen traveled with the film all over. So that was something I thought would be really different. Um, for me, uh, I guess this entire process is, is very personal. Um, so my connection to Mobile before 2017 uh, I'll probably say that the the drummer who influenced my creativity the most, uh, a gentleman named John Jabbo Starks, he was James Brown's drummer. And basically, of all James Brown's drummers, like he was sampled the most. So whenever I first thought of Mobile, I thought of, oh, that's where my idol was born. And then in 2017, uh, I'm told by Skip Gates that I'm the fortunate one percent uh and my family's here too my sister uh, dawn and my mother jacqueline um you know we were told during my episode of finding your roots that, like this is the first time i'm hearing the words clotilda cujo uh you know benin west africa and you know for a lot of african americans you know who just knew we were black and nothing else you know, I'm one of the fortunate few that now gets to learn history and where I came from and the slave ship and, and my family name. And instantly, my life is transformed. You know, hearing that, hearing that back in 2017 suddenly puts me in this position. Like, I'm, I'm somebody, I'm, I'm from somewhere. You know, and as a member of the Roots, like, I've, I've had history all over the place. So I have friends that say, hey, I'm Hungarian. I'm Italian. I'm now I can say, oh, I'm, I don't say I'm black anymore. I'm, I'm from Benin. You know what I mean? And that's just 25 percent of me. I don't 75 percent. I don't know, but at least I got that 25 percent. And um, just during the du during the period of the pandemic, um, my my curiosity of where my culture was. So this is where I'm learning like what our spiritual practice was and. Ife and, and Yoruba and all those things I always wanted to know, like, who am I? And all, you know, th that's, that's a question that all of us have. And the reason why um, I personally feel, and this is my opinion, that we embrace a certain type of uh, nihilism, Tupac-esque, Tupac in part my French, you know, a lot of us in the hip hop generation have this nihilism, nihilism uh, I don't give a fuck, like attitude. I don't give a fuck, I don't have feelings, I don't have emotions. It's because we don't know who we are and we don't know where we came from. So when this project lands in our, our laps, like, like for me, th this is very personal. 
and yes, as a movie producer, if I wasn't related to these people or, you know, I would I would have gotten involved. But for me, it's 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 the ongoing unraveling of me finding out who I am. So it was absolutely no question that I wanted to get involved no matter what. Yeah. Well, this has been an amazing journey these last past four years. These last past four years has been an amazing journey with Margaret and the crew. Um, to your point about what I said and how things change, so when I think of the Clotilda, there were 100 plus enslaved Africans on that ship. The ages ranged from two to 25. These were babies, teenagers, young adults, right? So Mobile benefited off of these young people, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? So my excitement is we're getting ready to benefit off Clotilda right, through tourism and all of those things. So that's what my excitement is. But you know, I've grown up with this story. My family is from Lewis's Quarters, established in 1870, and we still have family members that live there today. So, you know, this is a part of me, right? So of course, yeah, I was ashamed to talk about it in school because no one was talking about it, you know? I went to school with people that were descendants, but just something we didn't talk about. It was in, you know, we knew the story. But to embrace it now is just so, you know, having Margaret and, and family members to get us a talk, talking more, documenting, meaning Mary Elliott, Dr. Jackson, and just having all of these people collectively, I feel good, right? I want to tell the world. And with this film, it's going to reach. Mm. It's going to reach, you know, growing up in the 80s and 90s, you know, there was no internet, no Google, no Twitter, no Facebook. Now we have this platform that it can reach. So I'm excited for what's to come. Um, our neighbors, Montgomery and Birmingham, have these tourist attractions. I want Mobile to be like our neighbors. We're the home of Mardi Gras. People in New Orleans may say that, but no, we're the birthplace of Mardi Gras. Own that, yeah. So when people talk about Mobile, they say, well, I want to go to Mobile, I want to go to the Mardi Gras. When people talk about Mobile, now I want them to say, well, I want to go visit where the last documented slave ship landed in 1860. But again, it's not about the ship, it's about the people. I want people to be educated about the people. Mm -hmm. So the ship may be the draw, but once you know, we grab people's attention, then we can still tell stories about those descendants because there are other stories of those enslaved Africans that people don't know about. So that's what we're going to do with, with tourism and the, the Heritage House. So I'm excited. Listen, y'all forgot what the question was. <laughs> I guess it was about um, when you first were approached by Margaret about being in the film, if your feelings about participating changed at all during the course of making it, you know, why you thought you were going to get involved as opposed to what you got out of being involved in the film. Right. No, I, I, I don't think anything changed, right? Margaret, uh, when we spoke on the phone about the founding of the Clotilde, she was like, I'm on my way. <laughs> And when things started to be uncovered, it just struck me as what was supposed to be going on. You know, you got all these talented folks. When I looked at that list, um, making this happen, it was supposed to. There was a man from Plateau Magazine Point, Africa Town, uh, that I think New York folks uh, should know about, who you know had a hand in building part of Lincoln Center. You know, Albert Murray was from, from Plateau. You know, and he goes on Went Marcellus to found Jazz at Lincoln Center. And Albert Murray's the same folklorist, you know, who laid his hands on me, you know, 35 years ago. So I feel like Albert Murray is one of those people who put things in motion, right? So that his, his place and space could rise up and, and mean something. So 
it didn't really change. I, I think the old folks expected it. So that's all I got to say about that. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, Karen, and thanks for the question. Uh, particularly about what changed. Uh, I just recall back around 2017 or 18, at this, at this shy white girl from Mobile, Alabama, <laughs> come up to me and said, I'd like to feature you in this film. Uh, me? <laughs> and she had so much ambivalence about being a white person doing this, doing this project, but Margaret, this is epic. This is epic. Thank you. Thank you. So as you saw, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a scuba diver, and I have over 1,400 dives, and I've dove on, on slave ships all over the world, at least the ones that we know about, five of them. But this particular project has touched me so profoundly in extraordinary ways. Uh, every time I think about it, you know, I'm a very emotional person, and and engaging these artifacts makes it emotional, mm. makes it emotional, particularly this particular artifact. It is the only artifact that exists in historical record that is, we can see the outline of the ship. We can actually see the hole where the 110 was held and endured that almost three month journey. So I'm just one of two African Americans that's been in an actual real hole of a slave vessel. And so when I knew that dive was coming up, I said, this is going to be too much for me. I don't know if I'm going to be able to breathe even underwater. <laughs> so uh, a dear friend of mine, Sabrina Johnson, she's in the audience here, uh, we, we talked about it and said, well, maybe you need to compose an ancestral prayer. Hmm. And if you want, just a few, few verses. I'd I, I like to share that with you. It says, ancestral prayer for a Clotilde first dive. Reviving the spirits who travel on the Clotilda. Beloved ancestors, your voices have been quiet for 162 years, but your silence ends now. Your voices and memory are lifted now from this wretched vessel through us, and we welcome you to speak through us. Our connection will never, ever be broken. We are because of you. Thank you for reaching out to us. Blessings to your spirit, always. Mm. And so just five, five more seconds, and I'll be brief. I remember, I, I remember the, the, the environment that the, the vessel is in is very high risk, hazardous. You can't see. Uh, there's sharp objects in the water, including sharp alligator teeth and, and water moscans. <laughs> so we were aware of those hazards. So we, we went down on the vessel, and you can't see anything. It's like braille diving, zero visibility. So I remember feeling my way down the hull of the vessel, and I knew what I was looking for, this bulkhead. And beyond that bulkhead was the hole where these 110 were held. When I got to that bulkhead, I paused, and my partner I was leaving, leading, he was, we stayed very close, almost locked arms, because we didn't want to lose each other in this dark, uh, invisible environment. So I went over the side of the vessel into that hole. And when I got into that hole, again, after diving 1,400 times, I knew a little bit about being neutral and being born. But I was tumbling. I was falling. I was flipping. And I guess there was the ancestors telling me, you are experiencing exactly what we experienced, the turbulence. And I was able to right myself. And I remember telling my partner, I said, we, we, have to, we have to go up and, and let the space remain sacred. Mm. And so we surfaced on the water and we both looked at each other and exhaled. And I, I knew then that this was going to be a profound part of this narrative called the Clotilda in Africa Town. I always wanted to, or maybe I missed your answer. How, how deep is it to the, one, is it at the very bottom of yes. the land and how deep is the uh, water? Yeah, good, good question, uh, uh, Chris. So the, the, the wreck itself is pointing upstream. That's where, where Foster tied it off, anchored it off. It's pointing upstream and it's a little ways off the riverbank, but it's fallen uh, almost diagonally like this with the bow pointing up. 
and the stern pointing down toward the middle of the river. The stern section is at about 20 feet, and actually during low water, you can actually see the bow poking out of the water. We went down on the bow, and over the history of this wreck, again, the wreck was never lost. It's, it's, uh, I just completed uh, a phase three sort of uh, evaluation of the wreck back in May, along with Search and Jim Delgado, who you saw in the wreck, and that report's gonna be coming out soon. And it's going to be very revealing in terms of the history of the wreck and that it was never lost. There was, folks knew where it was and there was, as Jim mentioned in the, in the film, activities to, again, destroy this record. So, yeah, there is a God because this, this, this wreck was not destroyed and we're here to tell this story. So Quest is about 5 to 20 feet down. So, so very accessible. So even an amateur like myself, very, I, I can come uh, down and so see it myself. Very accessible. We say there's two types of uh, people in the world. Scuba divers like me and those that are eventually going to become scuba divers. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> it would be absolutely incredible to get you on that vessel. And, oh, I'm definitely going to do it. That's, I, I, five, <laughs> that's bigger than, like, I could do that. Yes, yes. And so that's part of our, our swim to scuba program that you saw in the movie here. And we hope to get the, the the descendant community on that particular vessel quest, so let's do it. Can we go right now? Hey. <laughs> you have to answer a question or two more before you go. I'm like, I, okay. I think I just but found job go. 15. Like, <laughs> I'm thinking it's like the abyss, like, you know, 49 billion leagues under the sea. That's a, I'm six feet tall. I could, you know. Yeah, you can. I could stand up and see this. This is amazing. Exactly. Um, okay, I'm going to go back a little and talk about another thing that I was thinking a lot about about this film, which is I know you shout out and give thanks to all the activists in the community in your end credits. Another group I was thinking about are the... I, I think the film really shows the importance of archivists and storytellers and folklorists um, for just keeping these stories alive. And I see the film is sort of part of that tradition. But um, I'm wondering if you can just talk a little bit about some of the archival elements in the film and um, the decision to have descendants read uh, the Zora Neale Hurston writing i mean i i kind of um i when when uh, sort of when i started was when barracoon came out it was a, roughly around the same time and um and i read barracoon and earl very early on i knew i wanted to use it as a way to stitch the film together um and we shot emmett um reading uh, like in development like very early i always knew that was going to be a part that would weave through people reading um, and that, that kind of being the almost the backbone of the movie because I feel like these stories that are kind of looped back, even Kern is sort of a, a spiritual descendant of Zora Neale Hurston and his footage that, I mean, less than a year ago, Kern was like, oh, I have some, I mean, I knew that was there, but I didn't know it was there, there, you know? Right. And um, he, yeah, I think Kern should talk about that perhaps. So there's a, there's a elder who was a teacher at the county training school. And she wanted me not to study carnival. She wanted me to study something that connected to the community where she worked as a teacher and counselor. And all these elders that you see in the film, she was their counselor. Well, when I come down to Mobile, Alabama, Miss McCann says, Get in the car, I want to take you somewhere. <laughs> yes, ma'am. <laughs> and she takes me to Lewis Quarters and she says, I want you to do this. How old were you? Tell them how old. <laughs> I, you were in I, grad school, right? Yeah, I must have been, you know, late 20s, something yeah. like that. Because, you know, she knew that we all have talents and we all have a purpose and she's going to put us in place. Everybody up in Africa Town know who Miss McCain is. See? <laughs> and I think it's important. I mean, you know, and then she would talk to the city councilman to say, you know, give this child some money. He's going to do X, Y, and Z. You know, give him a camera. Right? So, 
and go do this now, right? And so, and that's very much in the ethnographic tradition of Hurston. Mm -hmm. You know, her, her stuff was up in the Spingarn collection at Howard University suppressed because Knopf didn't want to publish black dialect. And so it was just waiting for their plant to come along. Mm -hmm. and, and that's how it goes. We were just waiting for the moment for those. And it's all been digitized now, so it's not on video no more. Good. <laughs> Good. Good. But, but it was waiting. Those elders who had transitioned, Miss mm -hmm. Dennison, you know. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, in, yeah. Um, well, unfortunately, our time is really short, but I guess I'd just like to ask the last question is, which is, you know, now that this film will be out in the world, it's going to open on October 21st, hopefully lots of people will see it. Um, what are your hopes for the film and or, you know, for Africatown and, and what getting this story out more widely will do for the community or for yourselves? Um, for me, I would love to see this story become a motion picture. It's just as big as Roots. I feel like this story is just as big as Roots. So um, that's one of my hopes. I, um, I hold festivals in Africa Town to celebrate our ancestors. I'll celebrate my fifth year in 2023. And we also have a play that um, I like for the young people to come to, they can understand it better because sometimes you give them a book, they might not want to read the book, but let's, let's bring this story to life. So uh, once this film is launched, I just would love to see um, Africa Town benefit from get its, get its just due. Mm -hmm. Because it, you know it's a suffering community, but we are unified and we love each other and we still, we're still fighting. Mm -hmm. Having, um You know, this is probably the eighth or ninth time I've watched this. So normally when, after the initial period of watching, and you know, your mouth's agape and wow, this, you know. So uh, this time I watched it through a different filter and I was thinking the same thing. I, I didn't want to be like the, 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 the suit in the room is like, hey, we could make a movie out of this, but <laughs> yo, I think that Jamie Foxx is Cujo Lewis. If you look, his, if you Google Cujo's face on, on the, J Jamie, I'm planning that to you right now. Agents call my agents, it's gonna happen, so. I, I wanna say something really quick. Um, I, I think there's a thing in the documentary community about like activist films and art films and um, you know, people are like, oh, the films that put the website at the end, it's like an activist film. But like, I, I'm, I'm, I feel like, you know, um, I really wanted the website at the end. So after you finish watching this film, you know where to go to, to like learn more, to like support the activist work that's already going on there. And the, and the website launched today, descendantfilm.com. And it was on the film for the, this is a new print, so we're so excited. But um, yeah, I want people to fucking go to the website. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just, just a very quick thought. You know, you saw me hopping in the film about this question of uh, justice. I think this is gonna be an incredible leverage to move us closer toward what that justice looked like. And I hope we get there sooner than later as this, this incredible community, resilient community, mm -hmm. tries to heal and find a place of peace and calm with this whole issue around Clotilde, mm -hmm. that ultimately we restore the balance as a human family and, and establish a profound sense of justice. Anything you want to add, or is that the last one? No, I mean, my sisters and brothers said it, so we're good. <laughs> all right, good. Well, I want to thank you all again so much for the film and for joining us here today. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. thank you. And Margaret, thank you for your creative genius. I, I appreciate you.